That damn cat won't stop following me. I look past John to see that, yep, the warden's ginger cat was looking at him through the doors of the chow hall. The guards were ignoring him, going out of their way to avoid him, and other inmates had taken notice of old One Ear as well. Some of them joked about how fortunate John was to have gotten the attention of the old cat, but for the seven of us that had been in the tower that day, it was damn creepy. Pete's death was still pretty fresh, so we were all on edge. The heist had been about two weeks ago, and we had expected something to be said about the missing pieces. We had expected more searches, inmates being questioned, and even more trips to confinement for some people. We had hidden the things that we would need for the ceremony, but no one had raised any sort of alarm. The day-to-day -day grind went on, chow, wreck, chapel, etc., and we got a little less anxious. Maybe we'd gotten away with it. Maybe he hadn't noticed what we had taken. Charlie doubted it, but Charles wasn't God, and he didn't know everything. Now, that old one-eared Tom was following John. I don't like it, Marcus said. That cat saw us in that office. It knows we took things out of there. Listen to yourself, I challenged. It's just a cat, Mark. What's it going to do? Tattle on us? I expected him to chuckle, maybe realize how nuts he sounded, but he just looked scared, kind of jittery, and glanced around uncertainly. You weren't here for it, so you wouldn't know. There was a guy, an inmate who got locked up for murdering a few of his bunkmates, and he swore up and down that the cat had something to do with it. Everyone had seen that cat befriend him. Everyone had seen it following him. And then he got picked up for things out of his control. That cat ain't normal. And it likes the warden a little too much. I looked over at Hadrian, hoping for some help here, but he was no help at all. Hadrian hadn't been his usual self lately. Not since he'd found that totem. All he wanted to do was look at it, to hold it, and though it was hard to notice, to quietly talk to it. He seemed to be telling its secrets, things too low for anyone to hear, and I didn't much like it. He kept whispering to it like a kid with a tin can on a string, and it was really freaking me out. Hadrian, I shouted, pulling him out of his stupor, and he looked lost before smiling dopily. Gentlemen, all we have to do is maintain the course. Halloween will be here soon, and the veil will be thin enough that we can summon Our Lady. Halloween? That's not what you said when we stole this stuff. You said the full moon. We can't wait a full month for this. We're already falling apart as it is. Another month would... But Hadrian turned on me angrily. Would you prefer to lead this brotherhood? I have gained new information since then, and if we want Jesse at her most powerful, then it has to be Halloween night. If you would prefer to go ahead with it on the full moon and not bring her back properly, then be my guest. But if you want to do it right, then we must wait. It's an extra three weeks. Did you have something better to do? I was taken aback by his aggression and put my hands up defensively. Whatever you say, boss, I, I didn't mean any disrespect. But Hadrian had already gone back to looking at the totem, ignoring all of us as he worshipped it with his eyes. It looked as though we would have to keep this on a little longer than expected, and in the meantime, the situation with old One Ear had escalated. He followed John everywhere, through the grounds, to the chow hall, to the rec yard, to the chapel, the place we had our quiet meetings, and even tried to follow him to the dorm. John was absolutely terrified of the cat, getting into trouble more than once for running down the sidewalk instead of walking. The cat seemed to be tailing him, but it wasn't alone. I never saw anyone, but it felt like there were eyes on us more often than not. Everyone knows that feeling you get, just having someone watch you, and it was exactly like that. The skin on the back of my neck felt like it wanted to crawl up into my hairline, and it got worse as time went on. When I talked to the others about it, they told me they had felt the same. 
Except, Frank said, as we sat around our racks that night, I think I've seen him. What? Marcus asked. You've seen someone watching you? I, I don't know, Frank admitted. It's just a feeling. Have any of you noticed the guy from H-Storm? The new guy? The guy who used to work here? We all nodded, knowing exactly who he was talking about. The idea that the guy got to live here after working was so ludicrous. Who had thought that was a good idea? He would... He would know how to work the keys, all the radio codes, the layout of the prison, and a lot of other information that could get him over the gates if he really wanted to. We had all seen the guy coming and going from the chow hall or on the rec yard, but he really didn't appear to be anything special. The strange thing was that he didn't seem to be tied to any particular dorm, not like his peers were. He had an odd sort of freedom when it came to the compound, and it allowed him to be places that he shouldn't be. Has he said anything to you? Marcus asked. Has he said anything that makes you believe he knows what we're doing? He hasn't said anything yet, but, but he looks at me like he... Frank struggled to come up with something and finally settled on the truth. He looks at me like the judge looks at you, when he knows just what you did. We all looked at Marcus, someone who had become our rock in Hadrian's absence, and he said that he would talk to him. I woke up two days later to the sound of people yelling and loud voices telling us to sit down and shut up. We were all on our bunks, the hour still pretty early, and as I looked around, I noticed one of our group was missing. John's bunk was empty, the covers messy, looking like someone had just gotten up for a minute and meant to come right back. I looked at Marcus, but he just shook his head. The guards by the door didn't move, but people came and went through the side door. We couldn't see the bathroom. None of us were allowed to leave our racks, but when they wheeled a gurney out through the side door, I had a pretty good view of it. Whoever was on the stretcher wasn't coming back, it seemed, and the nurses and guards around them weren't taking vitals or attempting CPR. They had zipped him into a bag, which meant he was a little beyond a medical call-out. The guards that hadn't gone with them filed in, and I could see Sergeant McCowan, the yard's latest hard-ass, standing at the tip of the spear. Okay, ladies, boxers and t-shirts at the end of your beds, and don't say a goddamn word. Failure will result in a trip to the box. Do it. Now. We complied, and they started searching our stuff. They pulled us aside a few at a time, searching our stuff when we stood there, and sending us to the day room once they were satisfied. They were being less than careful with our stuff, dumping it on the bed or tossing it onto the floor. And whatever they were looking for, it must have been important. Fortunately, the guard who came to search Hadrian's things was one of ours, and when Officer Gabrius came to search my bunk, he winked before beginning his search. What happened? I asked, side mouth, as he pretended to search. Your friend John was murdered, he whispered back. Someone cut his throat in the shower and left him there to bleed out. The guy in the dorm didn't find him until about 20 minutes ago, and it looks really bad. I was about to ask him more, but McCowan came by then, and Gabriel shut his mouth and finished his search. Okay, inmate, head to the day room, he barked, moving on to the next one as McCowan nodded and wandered off. Soon, the six of us that remained... We're all in the day room, the metal benches cold against our bare legs as we talked about what we'd learned. John had been killed sometime in the wee hours. He'd gotten up to go to the bathroom right after three o'clock count, and someone had drug him into the shower, slit his throat, and let him bleed out right there on the floor behind the privacy wall. No one noticed until about 30 minutes ago 
when the dorm officer had come out to do a round. The response had been quick, but by the time they got there, the killer had likely been long gone. The response had been quick, but by the time they got there, the killer had been long gone. In the absence of a suspect, they had decided to turn the whole dorm upside down, but no one had found anything incriminating. No homemade knife, no bloody uniform, nothing. It was as if John's throat had just opened itself up, and he had bled out behind the privacy wall in a filthy prison shower. Just as the sun began to rise, our breakfast postponed until something could be discovered. We had a very special guest. They sent us back to stand in front of our racks, and the placement of guards told me they were expecting trouble. They needn't have. All of us were tired, hungry, and confused, and that would have made for a lackluster riot. Also, I think we all sensed that the someone in question was not someone to be messed with, and that feeling proved to be right. The warden came in, looking resplendent in his pinstripe suit, and smiled at us all in a fatherly way that let us know that he wasn't mad, just disappointed. I understand that one of your bunkmates was killed this morning. I'm fully aware that you all have this code of honor or whatever, but if any of you have any information, it would be greatly appreciated if you came forward. Any information on any crime committed within the perimeter would be greatly appreciated. Just let your dorm officer know that you need to speak with me, and I'll be happy to take your statement. Don't worry about the time either, he said, his smile too large as it threatened to take in his ears. I'm always here. He left us then, and we were all left to look at each other in the wake of this departure. We understood fully. He knew that someone had taken his things. He knew where they were, and he intended to get them one way or another. We were down to six, but how many more could we lose before the cracks really began to show? You're still here. Thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague here. Always a pleasure to see all my new and old viewers coming by for another one of my spooky tales. If you'd like to support the show, you can always take part in one of our channel offers through Fume or Aura, or you can just click on another video when they come up. I'd really appreciate it. For our newer viewers, we also have lots of playlists and other things if you'd like to get caught up. I know some of my series have been going on for quite a while. If you'd like to get my latest book, there's a link down below that'll take you to my Amazon page. Towsy Homestead just came out, so if that's something you'd like to get your hands on, go ahead and have a look down there. If you'd like a signed copy, you can go ahead and email me from my email address on the site, and I'll get with you about shipping information and ship you a signed copy. If you'd like to support the channel in a more monetary fashion, we also have membership through YouTube, and we've got a Patreon that you can get the information for in the description. We have lots of tiers and everything to suit your needs. Patrons that support on the $10 tier, that's our Ghostly Reader tier, get a book anytime I write one, signed and on their doorstep. As you may have noticed, there's a list of patrons and members on the screen, and I'd like to personally thank every one of them for taking a hand in the future of this channel. Well, that's enough for tonight. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>